The United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP29, began in Azerbaijan yesterday. That was a year after an agreement at the same event to transition away from traditional fossil fuels. Joining us right now in just his second appearance at COP is Darren Woods. He's the CEO and chairman of ExxonMobil. And Darren, thank you for being with us today. This is a little bit of a different COP. There are a lot of nations that aren't there. And there are a lot of people wondering what the United States is going to do after President Trump was reelected to come back in. He had pulled out of the Paris Accords before. And I guess I wonder what you are thinking and what Exxon's plans are going to be in this post-election world. Well, uh, good to see you again, Becky. Thanks for having me on. I would tell you that, uh, you know, our investment horizon, as you know, is very long. We think about things uh, from a very strong foundation and fundamentals of where the future is going and then build a business and a plan based on that future. We're not, we don't get too overly focused on any one administration or the changes in those administrations. And at the same time, we recognize the challenge that the world faces today with trying to find affordable ways to uh, significantly reduce emissions while continuing to meet the growing demand for energy is a critical challenge. And we think as a company, with the businesses that we have and the work that we're doing, uh, we can bring a perspective there to help the world solve this problem in a rational, a thoughtful way that balances uh, economic needs, uh, the needs of societies to continue to grow, of people's prosperity to continue to rise, but at the same time reduce emissions. Darren, how do you do that when you don't know what the rules are going to be, what the financial incentives will be coming from companies. You, you all have laid out pretty aggressive plans for investing in carbon capture, things like hydrogen, things like lithium. But if you are no longer going to be compensated for some of those issues, if there's not some carryover plan where taxpayer dollars put forth for that, do you change your plans? Yeah, I think with all of our investments, they're obviously built on a, a foundation of generating advantage returns. We're bringing the advantages that we have as a company and uh, the skills and capabilities to lower the cost of doing these. But ultimately, there needs to be an incentive to reward those investments and generate a return. And if we find that those incentives uh, dissipate or go away entirely, then that would definitely change our investment plans. But I think the point we're trying to make is the world needs to have a, a long-term approach to uh, reducing emissions, that you can do it in a very cost-effective way, but you need consistency of approach and policy. And so we're here talking about uh, what some of those approaches could be to help solve those problems. You had vowed before to invest about $20 billion through 2027 on uh, some of those initiatives, some of those things like car carbon capture. Is that up for debate at this point? Will that change if the incentive structure is no longer there? So uh, we didn't vow. I would tell you we had a plan that laid out uh, spending to decarbonize our own business and work to decarbonize third-party businesses, and that totaled uh, about $20 billion through 2027, roughly split 50-50 uh, between our own emissions reductions and those for third parties. And we said for all those investments, they were a contingent on the right kind of policy and the right market incentives being in place to justify those investments, and that continues to be the case. What, what do you hear from other countries you're interacting with there, other companies? What, what do they think about the potential for change? Well, I think everybody's uh, interested in understanding uh, how the new administration is going to come into office and what changes he's going to make. You know, my, my position on it has been, you know, the Trump administration campaigned on a, uh, the idea that Biden broke it and, and he's going to fix it, Trump is going to fix it. I would say, you know, that kind of approach ought to be applied to all these things, the common sense approach that he's trying to bring to the U.S. and policy and regulation within the U.S. I think he can bring that same approach to um, the COP and, and con continue to uh, have the U.S. influence of policy around the world at how to rationally approach this transition and do it in an economically um, sustainable way. I know it's incredibly early, but have you had any um, conversations with the incoming administration or anyone who might be involved with it? Not since the election. I haven't had any conversations, no. Darren, I think the other big question is, is what happens with the major oil producers? Uh, will they step up 
drilling if there are things that are made easier, if it's regulations that are made simplified to do some of these things. I, we've made the point that the major oil companies have been very disciplined in their approach in terms of how much they're going to invest and where they're going to put those investments when it comes to fossil fuels, uh, both for oil and for natural gas. If the regulatory environment changed, would you be putting more money to work on um, trying to get more fossil fuels out of the ground? Well, I think uh, the answer to that question is uh, dependent on the time frame that you're looking at. I think certainly in the short term, our company, and I assume that many of our competitors, are focused on an optimized investment level today to, to maximize the returns on the dollars they're putting in the ground and are fairly unconstrained with respect to what we're doing here in the short term. I think as you head further along in, the, in time, medium to longer term, I think as, we, as the industry moves down the depletion curve, access to additional acreage is going to continue to be a really important uh, parameter in, in businesses continuing to produce. And so I think the Trump administration can bring additional clarity and certainty around that access to acreage, which today uh, isn't available to the industry. So I think in the short term, I wouldn't expect to see a lot of big changes. I think going forward, it's really around making sure that you have the optionality to continue to do what we have, to do what we have been doing. We, we've seen oil prices actually come down, uh, WTI and, uh, and Brent have both come down over the last several months. Um, what, what's the price where oil is no longer profitable or what's the break-even point for you uh, at ExxonMobil? I think it's, it's going to vary across the industry. We have always said we want to be below $40 a barrel. We feel very comfortable. Uh, with a break-even price. We can, you know, as you know, we've cut a lot of cost out of the business and really focused on bringing uh, technology to our developments to lower the capital uh, cost as well. And so a break-even below 40 is, uh, we're pretty comfortable with that. And, and the demand picture that you see these days? Well, demand is at uh, record highs right now. If you look at the third quarter, demand was for oil was at record high, gasoline, diesel. And I see as we go into next year, we're going to continue to see, I think, a very good, healthy demand for petroleum products. Um, the, the counter to that, though, is there's lots of supply available today. And so that supply-demand balance and the link that we see in the market is what's keeping the, the oil markets uh, fairly stable.